Pastor Carol and I did uh, arrange our, our attire this morning. <laughs> Uh, we have two um, uh, messages this morning. The first will come from Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And it's a scripture lesson about uh, the, the wisdom of Christ and the power of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous, miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. In the section, second scripture will come from Mark chapter 10, 32 through 34. And this is a scripture about Jesus predicting his death for the third time. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. The word of God for all the people. Thanks. 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 still. And may my lips say words that you would like to have me say. And may we all hear, including me, the word you would have us each hear, however different that might be. Because of where we are in our journeys. Be present with us, we pray, in a special way. Amen. Amen. For the message about the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing, perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In World War II, there's a story that comes out that uh, an American GI was down in his foxhole as the bullets were whistling over his head, bombs bursting in the sand near him. And suddenly, another American GI jumped into the foxhole with him, which stunned the American that was already there. And together, they huddled together as the shots and firepower continued to go on around them, deeply in fear. And then suddenly, 
the GI who had jumped into the foxhole noticed something in the dirt. It was somewhat shiny. And he reached down and it was a cross, a small cross. He brushed it off and looked at it. And he said, how in the world does this thing work? And an innocent question. How in the world does the cross work? I don't normally wear a cross. I've worn them a few times in worship. I don't wear one uh, all the time like some folks do. And I'm not criticizing people who wear the cross. We know it's a good reminder to us of what our faith is. Uh, it, it, it probably doesn't work in the sense that if I rub it, there's a genie that's going to come out of it and just really help me. Uh, it, it's not like a, a lucky rabbit's foot. Although I've always wondered about that statement. I wonder what the rabbit thought about that. <laughs> uh, but, you, uh, but what is there in the cross that is powerful? We, our hymns this morning, uh, in the cross of Christ thy glory, towering over the wrecks of time. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. Last week we sang, uh, Above the hills of time, the cross is gleaming, and from it love's pure light is richly streaming. To cleanse the heart and banish sin away. To this dear cross, the eyes of men are turned. There is in the cross a certain light, if you will. And some people put lights on a cross at different points. I have somebody. Uh, who doesn't live too far from us, during the Christmas season, they have a large cross that's lit up beautifully. And they're lucky that it has stayed there for uh, the seven or eight years that I've seen it. Because some night I might just sneak in <laughs> and take it out. Because I, I, it's that nice, it's that, it, it's that powerful. But that would probably not be the best meaning of the cross to steal. <laughs> but uh, and, and not the power of the cross in that way. In the mountains of North Alabama, in a camp called uh, uh, Sonatega, I think it is, is how you pronounce it. I may have just murdered that. But David Hutto, who was the founder of that camp, with his... Uh, other visionaries decided that on the highest mountain in that mountainous region of North of Alabama, uh, which was part of their camp, they would erect a large cross, and they did. And there were light, and there are lights on it. And uh, a person tells a story uh, about the cross. Well. Davy, they called him Uncle Davy, who was sort of like the camp counselor, camp owner, or uh, director, I guess. Uh, he, he has collected stories that people have given him over the years about the influence of that cross on the mountain. One such story I would share with you, it took place during a rare snowstorm in Alabama. In the day following the storm, a very well-dressed businessman came to the camp site and said to uh, Uncle Davy, uh, I need to uh, go to that cross. 
I want to go to the foot of the cross. And will you take me to it? And Uncle Davy said, well, you know, we've had an ice storm, a snowstorm. It's really slippery. It's several miles up the hill. And is there, uh, you know, it really would be better if we did it on another day. And the man insisted, no, I want to go there now. I want to go there now. And so David got in his four-wheel drive Jeep, and they drove to the cross. And on the way, the man told Uncle Davy this story. He explained that the night before, during the storm, he was flying a single-engine plane from Atlanta to Birmingham. The storm caused him to become disoriented and to lose his bearings. He said he was blinded by the freezing rain and snow and sleep that was hitting his uh, plane, and the visibility was near zero. And over a short wave radio, he frankly called the airport for help. And they said, well, where are you? And he said, I don't know. I'm, I'm lost. His instruments were not reading, or he didn't have the right instrument panel that, you know, we have today. And uh, he could not tell them. And then, as he was on the phone with them, this shortwave radio, or, or communicating with the shortwave radio, suddenly he sees this light of the cross. And he tells him, he said, well, I just saw a light on a cross. And they said, we know where you are. And they gave him directions on how to get to the airport. And he landed at the airport. And when he got there, they told him, oftentimes, pilots have used that cross as a mark as they fly between Birmingham and Atlanta. And then he discovered, uh, in addition, that, the, that this light uh, that the airport knew about uh, had done something else to it. And he continued to share with Uncle Davy his story. He said, the reason I was flying this night in this storm was because I was running away from my marriage and I was even contemplating suicide. And then this light, this cross, appears in the darkest time. And uh, I believed and I knew that this was somehow God's sign to me. And I made a vow that I would go to the foot of that cross tomorrow, the day that he's talking to David, and commit my life. Indeed, he went over to the cross and knelt down and prayed. And Uncle Davy prayed with him. Later, as the stranger left, he said to Uncle Davy, The cross helped me to find my way to safety last night. But more important, I have found my way back to God. I'll never be the same again. Well, years later, a minister who had heard this story told it in a sermon. And one of the lay people that were part of his church came up to him afterwards and said, that's my story. And I've gone back to that cross many times over these years. 
whenever I have felt like I am worn out or I need renewal or being tempted to run away, then it has always empowered me in a new way. The light of the cross streaming there for us. When I was in college, I attended Central Methodist Church in uh, Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and always during Lent, it, it was a large, large Methodist church. And always during Lent, they put a cross, uh, it was kind of three sections over there in the middle section. And in the middle section, they took two or three of the pews and they erected a very large cross. I don't know why it was, but many times during that, during that particular year, I always ended up seated at the foot of that cross. And I know it made an impact on me. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The cross is also a reminder to me of the sacrifice that Jesus gives for each of us. As it says, uh, the message of the cross is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God that there is a powerful thing in that cross. Powerful symbol. Powerful action. And uh, as many of you know, I, uh, a few weeks ago I shared uh, the, one of the preachers that I had respected and have respected is Fred Craddock. He had died at 86. And uh, uh, I may have shared this story with you, but I can hardly remember what I preached last week. And uh, I can't even remember when I was supposed to get together with my friends. <laughs> so uh, uh, it may be, maybe uh, uh, <clears throat> this story is worth repeating. Anyhow, he had gone to Canada as a guest lecturer, and he had gone to Canada uh, out in Western Canada with just a very light uh, jacket because they said. No, nope, you don't need to dress warmly. It's okay. You know, it's just like you'd say, you don't need to dress warmly in New England once spring comes. It's all <laughs> wonderful. And, and so he got there and he said, he got a call in his uh, motel room early on the day he was to speak, which I think was a Saturday. And the guy said, we've canceled the program. We just have had three feet of snow, if you haven't looked out your window yet. And everything is shut down. Nobody's driving around town, obviously. And uh, if you can get out, there's a cafe. It'll be the only place open, about a block or two from where you are. So he looked out. Sure enough, there was the snow, and he managed pushed the door open enough and the motel owner had a shovel and had brought a <coughs> shovel over near the door and he was able to shovel enough to get out in his warm winter jacket, shivered all the way down to the cafe and he said it was packed. There wasn't any room. And uh, he went in and they said, uh, what do you want? And he said, may I see the menu? The guy who came over was a large burly man, gruff and loud, tattoos on his arm, and he said, we don't have any menu. What we have is uh, uh, what you, you mean you want soup. 
And he said, well, if you say so. Because uh, that guy said, that's all I got. Now take it or leave it. And he said, well, uh, soup, that's just what I was going to order. Soup and coffee. I, I, I love that for breakfast. <laughs> and a few minutes later when the soup arrived, Dr. Craddock said it was indescribably horrible. <laughs> Some sort of unrecognizable gray broth that looked just awful and it tasted even worse. He could not eat it at all. Just about then, the door of the cafe opened and a blast of frigid air swept through as an older woman came in, all bundled up, but obviously very, very cold. The temperature outside was far below zero. The woman's face was red and chapped, and she was trembling and shuddering from the cold. She sat down at the only seat left in the cafe. The burly owner walked over to her to take order. Cup of coffee, please, she said. Look, lady, you don't drink coffee in here. Order a meal or you leave. But I just want coffee. It's so cold outside. Couldn't I just sit here a few minutes to warm up? No way, said the owner gruffly. Order a meal now or get out. The attention of everyone in the cafe, Dr. Craddock said, was on that conversation. The older woman's eyes began to moisten with tears as she stood to leave. When suddenly a voice boomed from the other side of the cafe. If she leaves, we're all out of here. And immediately at that point, all the rest of the customers, which were mostly all men, stood up to leave. All right, all right, the owner said, you win, you made your point. Sit back down, everybody. The lady can stay. She can have her coffee, and she can have soup, and it's on me. Everybody cheered. The patrons all happily returned to their places, and things got back to normal. Then Fred Craddock said this, wrote this, I read it. I sat back down, and I could hear the slurping as people ate their soup. And I thought, well, if they can handle it, I can. So he picked up his spoon and dipped it into the gray soup, and amazingly, somehow, it tasted different now. It was a pretty good soup. Well, it tasted like something very familiar. It tasted, he said, like bread and wine. It tasted like bread and wine down just like Holy Communion. I had experienced Holy Communion in the cafe on that day. You see, when people stand for what is right, there is Holy Communion. When people are willing to sacrifice for someone else, that's what the cross is about. Maybe share an offering.